Felix here. Imagine you knew what some of the largest hedge funds have just bought and you thought, well, why don't I just buy the same thing and I'll make as much money as those guys without having to pay them 20% of the profits or whatever they charge in fees. Well, let's test that theory. Let's actually walk through five of the stocks that institutional investors, hedge funds, have bought the most of just. And I'll walk you through here from my little garden in the south of France, whether that's actually a good idea. And there are some good ideas in here and maybe some that are, well, make us think about it. And my goal here is always to make you better informed, to educate you, to help you make better decisions rather than just blindly following along. So stock numero uno, or I should probably say that in French, my French is a little rusty. Um, so fine. Okay. So let's just look at the opening scorecard here for SoFi and it's growing nicely. It gets a B for growth. Cash flow, so-so. Profit health, so-so. Relative value is a C. That's actually quite good. It means it's not super expensive. It's actually relatively reasonably priced, which I actually agree with. And I will put out a separate video on SoFi just to get, dive in a little bit deeper into that. And price momentum is a D. I also like that. It means the stock price hasn't gone up a lot. So I, I, I like things that are on sale. Now I've got some notes here on a, on a phone so that I can give you real insight. Now, these are the metrics I look at for every single stock. If I know nothing about a business, I just look at this. What's the gross profit margin? That tells you how hard is it to replace that business, that product with another competing product. 82% gross profit margin is extraordinary. It's massively wonderful. Anything above 60 is generally very good. 82 is fantastic. And then you look at revenue and you look at the little green chart and it's gone up a lot. So it shows you they're growing. So it's a growth company that's growing. It's kind of what we want from a growth company while I'm getting bitten here by the uh, French mosquitoes. They know I'm German, you see. And profitability, well, they've actually just made a touch of a profit. Not a lot, though. Return on invested capital, hard to look at that with a growth company because they haven't really had the profit phase yet. But we can look at long-term earnings growth, which is just profit growth. Earnings is a fancy word for profits. 43%. That's pretty good, right? That's pretty extraordinary. So the numbers look okay. And then we look at how are they performing in terms of earnings per share? Are they beating analyst expectations every quarter. And that tells you a lot about management quality, I believe. How good are they at sandbagging, if nothing else? Sandbagging is a, a, a good old principle where you make the market believe you're going to do X, but actually you're going to do X plus 10% or plus 20%. And every quarter you have a job where you have to convince them that you are going to do a certain thing, but you'll actually be able to do more. It's a, it's a, it's a skill, but it, it takes, a, takes a good manager to, to, to figure that out. And the last six quarters, they have beaten earnings per share, profits per share. And you can see they're now making a just under three cent profit per share. So that, in my view, is going to keep increasing. So you can see why it's a growth story that's turned profitable. The market likes companies the moment they become profitable because most of the risk is gone at that point. They're very unlikely to go out of business, uh, whereas an early startup is, well, a lot more risk, right? Okay, here's another company. This is one of Kathy Wood's favorite, one of her largest holdings, and it is what sucks the life out of you and wastes most of people's creativity. Roku, the sort of smaller Netflix, Amazon, whatnot, streaming service. And well, look at the numbers. Cash flow is very good. Why? People pay in advance for the service. And then it's growing so-so. It's not very profitable, but relative value is a C. So it's kind of cheap. So again, you might think, well, if they can pull something out of the bag, then they could actually become very profitable. And because the stock's kind of trading at a discount, it could be an interesting thing to buy. So let's look at gross profit margin here, 45%. Is that good? Is that bad? We'd have to actually run a direct comparison to say at Netflix to see what their number is. It's not wonderful, but it's also not terrible sort of a no man's land for me. Revenue has been growing quite nicely. 
they're losing money they are not really growing their profits so i'm not loving it so you'd have to have a really fundamental strong conviction that this sector streaming and roku in particular is going to knock it out of the park i don't have that conviction i don't have actually that insight into roku i look at the headline numbers and i go risky risky and i know kathy likes risk i know kathy buys at mysterious times and I don't really buy, like to buy at mysterious times. I like to have a very, very clear trajectory of why something is going to go up. Okay, here is one that nobody ever talks about. The Green Giant. No, they don't make sweet corn. Is that a brand you have in the US? The Green Giant? Maybe that's a British thing. Anyway, they, they, they can sweet corn. These guys can something else. They can GPUs, graphic processing units. And NVIDIA, of course, is the shovel of the AI industry right now. You've got Google, Microsoft, Amazon, all competing, Tesla, all competing to buy the most GPUs possible and become the software leader in AI and or the cloud AI leader in AI. And NVIDIA is just sitting there smirking to themselves going, you're going to have to buy my chips, my cards. And then, of course, NVIDIA doesn't actually manufacture them. They outsource that, um, which is sort of the Apple approach to life, which I like because it means you have higher margins and less capital expenditure. You let somebody else worry about building all those factories. And in fact, you probably sell them your service to do so. So it's a glorious business. And if you just look at the headline numbers, it's kind of like the perfect student. B for cash flow, B for growth. A for profit health. Those are the numbers we look at. A for price momentum just means the stock's gone up a lot. We don't actually love that. But I will show you in a second why NVIDIA isn't actually expensive. And you might be like, eh, no, no, of course it is. Look at the price. It's trading at like, I don't know, close to $1,000 or something. Surely it's expensive. Well, okay, look at this first. Gross profit margin is 72%. For a manufacturer, and yeah, I know they outsource it, but they still sell a physical product, not some sort of digital fintech service or a streaming service or something like that. They actually ship a physical product. A 72% gross margin is extraordinary. I mean, nobody ever does that. Honestly, it really is something staggering. And it shows that they have incredible pricing power, incredible pricing power to rip off their customers, which says to me there isn't an alternative because there are smart people at Google and at Microsoft and at Amazon and at Tesla who would buy something else if it did something nearly as good as NVIDIA and it was cheaper. There isn't. Otherwise, they would not be able to get away with this daylight robbery uh, in terms of pricing. So absolutely love it. And they make 30 billion profit a year out of 60 billion revenue, like enough set. Try doing that with the business. It's, it really is extraordinary. And they're growing insanely 34% profit growth. So they're doing absolutely everything right. So can I see, understand why people are buying this? Yes. And wait for this number here. NVIDIA right now is trading at 36 times 2025 profits. That might seem like a lot, but pretty much every software company out there, pretty much every tech, co tech company out there is trading at almost the same valuations. And this is cheaper than it has been historically. Why? They've just been growing so freaking much. So even though I would expect growth to slow, I still expect them to grow, but I expect growth to slow, say in 10 years, you would own NVIDIA, if you bought today, you would probably own NVIDIA at about a 10x multiple. And that means you make a 10% return a year on that investment, which is pretty glorious. And you might think that isn't enough. Compound that over time, keep going forward, and eventually you'll own the stock for almost nothing. With great companies, you are forgiven for paying too much. It's a very, very simple rule. Right? Look at Microsoft. Microsoft has lost about 60% market share in the operating system space. Share price has gone up 20 times in that time period. So well-managed companies with great margins, great pro not necessarily great product, just great management and the ability to sell it as Nvidia seems to be able to do insanely well. Here's one of Ray Dalio's favorites, Google. 
I made a video a couple of weeks ago about Google and I was telling you how excited I am about it. I know everyone says, oh, it's a big old boring business and their search is dead and it's text-based and AI is going to disrupt them and Sam Altman will do the Sam Altman search engine powered by Microsoft so the regulators don't go and kill Microsoft off. And yeah, I think that's all true, but Google is the beast. And what I just said about Microsoft losing massive market share in operating in the operating system market, yet share price has gone up 20%. Google can lose a massive share of the search market and still make more money, in my opinion. And will they put out better search? Well, they already are, and they will. They've got basically unlimited budget. So yes, I wouldn't write these guys off. I think the business is well run. They also have the power to pretty much acquire anything and, and everything that they want, and they just dominate. I mean, how often do you say Google it, right? Before that comes chat GPT it. Yeah, to an extent that'll happen more and more, but it'll take time. And even then the question is simply, can Google continue as an advertising business, which is what it is, to attract enough advertisers and can they deliver those adverts at a higher margin? I believe they can. How? Using AI, ironically. You can just streamline businesses with AI and, and make them cheaper and better to run and you can give your advertisers better results and it'll cost you less to do it. So I think the advertising business, which is Google and, micro, and, and Meta, is going to do very, very well. So I'm totally with Ray here on this one. My buddy Ray. <laughs> okay, here is one you people don't talk about a lot. Oracle. And if you remember 2000, I was working at a dot-com company back then. Oracle was like open AI. Everybody loved Oracle, except you could trade it publicly. Well, you can trade open AI through Microsoft realistically, but it was like the thing that was going to dominate and own the internet and nothing would ever happen without it. And then have a look at the stock chart that happened after 2000. But they are back. They're a big cloud company. They have enterprise software that is widely used and sticky. And if you look at their numbers, well, they're very profitable. Just look at that number. They're very profitable. Hard to be very profitable if your product sucks. And their gross profit margin is 71%. Same as NVIDIA, ironically, who make a hardware product. So yes, NVIDIA does a better job than Oracle for sure, but that's a very, very good margin. And it means that, again, the competition is limited. They make 10 billion profit a year and their long-term profit growth, as I'm getting bitten here by French mosquitoes, is 12%. So it's pretty good. And the expectation is that they are benefiting just like everybody else who's got something to do with AI, they will just benefit from this. There is a truth in when certain industries, new industries really grow and blow up, everybody who's in it gets part of the pie. And that's why a lot of the time, the smart thing to do is just to look at the industry and the sector and go, is that industry growing a lot? Well, yes, AI, cloud computing, all that stuff, enterprise software is growing a lot and everybody in that space is going to get, get a piece of the pie. And Oracle is not massively expensive right now. It's trading at relatively reasonable multiples. In fact, I'll tell you what the multiples are. So the multiple for Oracle is 22 times profit, which really isn't monstrously expensive if you look at all the other guys out there, the Microsofts and the Googles and the Amazons and so on. And you can therefore see that a hedge fund goes and looks at this and says, I think they'll catch up. I think they'll go and at least become average in their multiple, which might mean it goes to 25 or 28 or something like that. And then they might exit. And that can be a good thing to do is just look at an industry that's growing a lot and pick a little bit the loser <laughs> in the sector, the least sexy player, as long as they're running their business well, which these guys clearly are, otherwise they wouldn't have these margins. And then just hold it until they catch up to the rest of the pack. That's a very, very, very simple strategy. So when I look at these businesses, would I buy them all? Not necessarily, but there's certainly stuff in there like Google that I like. I think SoFi is a, is a bit of a higher risk play. You need a bit more time for that as a tra transition phase for them. But NVIDIA is an extraordinary business. And hopefully this gives you a little bit of insight into why these guys pick it. So don't blindly follow. You don't know what their strategy is. It could be a short-term strategy. It could be a long-term strategy. So you really have to come to a place where you can make assessments yourself. 
we have a whole educational playlist. Literally go on the channel, click on the playlist, and it says educational videos. There are loads of them. If you start playing them, maybe play them more than once, a lot of the stuff's going to become clearer. How to pick stocks, how to never lose money on stocks, how to learn how to trade, how to read stock charts, all these things that you should have been taught in school. None of it is rocket science. Bankers aren't particularly smart. They just like to wear shiny suits and look very important and cocky. And you can learn the same stuff. And if that's what you're interested in, you are in the right place. That's my whole mission here as, a, as an ex-banker is to spread the knowledge we learned on the trading floor with people out there, level the playing field. I love you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, share it with somebody and I hope to see you on the next one. I set out on a mission to find an industry and then companies and stocks that I could buy and hold forever.